Thank you very much for coming. My name is Eric Zelo. I'm the chair of the Department of History and Philosophy and also the chair of the committee that is organizing the Connections Lecture Series, of which this is the first event. Um, a few years ago, we had a series called Core Connections, and in many ways, this is a kind of revival of that, but with a slightly different mission. So the Connections Lecture Series, which I hope will continue for many moons to come, uh, works at showcasing uh, interdis interdisciplinary scholarship and interdisciplinary ways of thinking about challenges in the natural world and in the course of human affairs. Uh, generally speaking, the world does not work in disciplinary, easy disciplinary boundaries. It, the questions that we need to ask, the problems that we face, involve a lot of interconnections and a lot of challenges that require different approaches. And so this is really a series about that. And, and I think climate change is one of those topics that definitely winds up crossing a lot of boundaries very quickly. There's a lot of natural sciences there. There's a lot of uh, questions in terms of social sciences and politics and sociology and anthropology. There's a lot of questions in terms of the way that the humanities look at things as well. And so the committee decided as we were thinking about what we wanted to do for our first series of events to look at climate change from a variety of vantage points. And so we have three different things uh, happening today that I hope that you'll take part in. Obviously you're here for the first one and I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment. Uh, at 4 o'clock in this room, free food. We'll just sort of mill around and chat. We've, we've got the good food, the bacon-wrapped scallops, the single best thing that Sodexo does. And that's what we're, I mean, uh, they, they are, mm, beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Um, and then at 5.30 in Alphon 205, our second speaker of the day, Cameron Wake, will be talking about the, uh, the science and the politics of climate change and things that we might be able to do here in New England. His focus is really on New England. All right, but our first speaker, uh, and I learned this on Twitter um, yesterday, his, his nickname is Captain Weather. So that's a pretty, pretty good nickname. Um, we'll have... Dr. Climate and, and uh, Captain Weather today. So it's like a superhero matchup, which is, which is pretty great. Uh, James Fleming is Charles A. Dana Professor of Science, Technology, and Society at Colby College. He has been a research associate at the Smithsonian Institute, holds degrees in astronomy, atmospheric science, and history. His books include The Meteorology, Meteorology in America, 1800 to 1870, from Johns Hopkins Press, Historical Perspectives on Climate Change, from Oxford University Press, uh, The Calendar Effect, from AMS, Fixing the Sky, which will be the topic of his discussion today, from Columbia, and Inventing Atmospheric Science, published by MIT uh, just last year. He's been a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, the American Meteor Meteorological Society. He's testified before Congress, consulted with with the General Accountability Office, uh, served on panel, panels, this is a fairly substantial CV here, I think you'll agree, uh, and served on panels at the National Academies of Sciences. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion earlier today with an environmental sociology class that was wide ranging and, and covered not only history, uh, but a lot of uh, Jim's other expertise as well in terms of policy and advocacy. So he's interested and able to speak on that as well. Please. Join me in welcoming James Fleming. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to be on this side of the Saco River because I went down the wrong side this morning and it was a little <laughs> bit late. Uh, but no, uh, 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 Eric's been a great host and uh, looking forward to the day here. Um, it is lunchtime, so I'll try to keep this uh, a little bit more entertaining than not, I hope. And uh, none of it will be on the final exam, I don't think. Um, yeah, so I, I'm here because of an airplane crash and uh, used to be a research meteorologist. Used to fly in clouds, I used to write little computer code to model clouds, and then we almost clipped off some, or we almost crashed, we clipped off some pine trees landing at a regional airport, and uh, I was in charge of the particle collector which collected the pine tree. We didn't crash, but we almost did, and I said, gee, I need a new mode of engagement with the atmosphere, and I think that'll be history. So this is a, this is a history of uh, 
intervention. Uh, I just got off of a National Academy panel called Climate Intervention. You can get the free PDF from the National Academy, two volumes. One is on uh, uh, modifying the albedo or, or changing the insulation coming into the earth. And the second volume is on carbon capture and safe storage, not, not just capturing it. Uh, and I'll wave two books. Uh, uh, this book was 2010. I, if it's not in your college library, it'll be at there by the end of the day. It's called Fixing the Sky, the Checkered History of Weather and Climate Control. And that's uh, based on this. And I'll get to the Academy report near the end when I start to talk a little bit about more about policy. And then, uh, as Eric said, I just finished Inventing Atmospheric Science, which is uh, from 1900 to 1960. And I dropped the story off just when Ed Lorenz develops the chaos theory and we finally have a weather satellite flying. And it kind of goes from Marconi to weather satellites and from, uh, from uh, uh, early uh, attempts to make a meteorological time machine to look into the future to the point where we said, well, there is really a limit to our provision and how far we can see into the future. So again, if it's not in your college library, it will be as a uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, so, uh, f fixing the sky. Um, when I when I moved to Maine, it was uh, this was the New York Times that day. It was 1988, and I got a copy of it. And we had the rental truck, and we're moving up from Washington. And I remember quipping to my spouse. I said, uh, it "Looks like we're headed in the right direction," because Jim Hansen just said, "Global warming has begun," and that's the beginning, 1988, of a vast expansion of the literature from journalists, from scientists, from um, pundits, from uh, sociologists, from ec economists. And so the literature just exploded. Uh, Hansen has nuanced the statement since, but this was the cover of the New York Times uh, on the greenhouse effect, uh, July, about July 1st, 1988. Um, <coughs> the, 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 my assumption is to get involved in climate intervention in a heavy-handed way or to think about fixing the earth through an engineering scheme, you really have to be motivated. And one of the motivations is fear that the treaties aren't going to work, that individual virtue and mitigation and, and, and changing light bulbs is not going to work. And so that a lot of engineer types have thought about let's make an artificial volcano or let's make the oceans absorb more carbon or let's put a whole bunch of water pumps on the polar ice cap, maybe a million of them, and have them make more polar ice. And so engineering pro projects are, are rising, especially since 2006, when Paul Critson wrote his editorial about uh, a policy co uh, contribution to climate change. It, it was, it, his, his contribution was let's use naval guns and shoot uh, sulfates into the stratosphere in the tropics. <coughs> and so <laughs> if you think that's a good idea, just, just hang in there, like uh, buckle your seatbelt. Um, then we have my friend uh, Bridget Schneider works at Potsdam with the uh, IPCC. Uh, she works on the color diagrams. And, and what we did, what happened was the, I, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change always published their reports with, with, uh, with Cambridge University Press. And they came out a year later. And they were great big thick things with color separation. And then our world passed what I call the PDF horizon. It was somewhere about 1992, 93, but more, more and more and more since then. So all of our information comes now pretty much free and pretty much in color. And so climate change is a very colorful field. And uh, the iconic uh, blue marble, which was uh, developed in 1972 as a NASA image from the Earth, is then contrasted with the burning world images, the, the angry red planet of pr projected climate change. And this is num another way that climate change is mostly, think about this, climate change is mostly in color. And it's mostly in deeper and darker and darker reds. And red is the bullfighter's color. And red is an angry color. And Earth has turned into an angry red planet based on the climate models. <coughs> so that's another motivating factor, is this move from uh, our blue and white home in, in, uh, in space to uh, maybe an uninhabitable place that needs serious fixing or needs a, uh, metaphors are flourishing like we're the Titanic and we need the lifeboats uh, kind of metaphors. So just, this is just like a warm up to, to show that you have to be a very concerned environmentalist and, and think that engineering's the answer before you really can jump into this. And you get the Time Magazine cover to be worried 
be very worried. I think there's some be afraid, be very afraid tropes out there too. <coughs> and then um, kind of what I call, this is for my journal, I call it Strongest Readings, a journal of Strongest Readings. Uh, stop climate change before it changes you. And this, this is a strong misreading of how fast climate change would affect the evolutionary strains. You're not going to turn into a fish person or the creature from the Saco Lagoon or something. Uh, <coughs> but these, these the people are desperately, we, uh, we've been in a lot of meetings about how do you picture climate change. And one way is to, you photograph polar bears on shrinking ice flows or you, you make up some sort of an image because you can't see the climate. Astronomer can see a supernova, they look in a telescope, they can sit on an observatory hill for the evening, but a climatologist has to gather data and have different bully pulpits. Uh, usually meteorologists had other people <coughs> taking measurements in networks. And so maintaining the networks for long periods, seeing instruments changing over the network period, these are very important kind of sociological problems is how do you maintain standards. And then if you get a bully computer model or a special satellite, you can begin to make authoritative statements. That's a whole other talk, but, but it, it's, and it's really not related to that picture, but um, I thought the fish picture was kind of cute, so I put it in there. Uh, we do have climate physicians. I think Dr. Climate's here with us today. And uh, <laughs> this comes from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. It was published in Nature Magazine, and it's an image I published in a paper I called uh, Climate Physicians and Surgeons. And this is the metaphor that the, the earth is sick and we need to heal it. Uh, they, they use the, the blue marble venue, which is sort of Madagascar, Africa. Uh, you know, all the ills of the world come uh, in this picture this way, semiotically. And then uh, the, three, uh, the three white males with their ties on and their thermometers are checking the temperature of the planet. And they're diagnosing and then uh, prescribing uh, probably a low-carbon diet for the planet. This comes out of uh, cartooning based on the, uh, oh, Nature's, Nature Magazine's coverage of the IPCC. And so the metaphor of uh, f uh, the, 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 actu the uh, reality of fear and then the metaphors are flying on how do we fix or stop climate change or heal a broken planet. And then there's uh, this new, I just found this one the other day, I couldn't resist. Uh, just say ah, and uh, the climate physician will diagnose the earth. This is also semiotically in the in the southern hemisphere. So the ills are the, the, the orifice there is, is to be healed is through the south. Uh, this one was in, in the south. The, the thermometer is going in south of Madagascar, and uh, the, the the white western males. Uh, w one guy's from Argentina, but they're gonna they're gonna fix it through the IPCC. <coughs> and so uh, climate semiotics. I mean, maybe it's something you hadn't thought about, but but the people I work with deal with images as well as meanings, as well as the, the whole panoply of, uh, <laughs> of uh, hum humanistic interpreta interpretive uh, approaches to climate. Uh, there's the one on planetary surgery. Does the planet need a surgeon? And where would you slice? Who would, who would see, I never had LASIK eye surgery, but I had some operations that now I don't need glasses to read. And so it's really kind of neat. But I signed the form, and I said, if you ruin my eyes, it's okay. I mean, he had to sign the medical release form. But who would sign that form for the planet? Who has the authority to say, yeah, go ahead and do the surgery? I know that we're terminally ill. Let's take out the sunlight. Let's block some sunbeams. Let's, let's uh, turn the oceans into a soupy green uh, source for carbon uh, uptake. You know, that kind of, that kind of discourse. It, when, when, you, when you take it to the planetary level, you, you really get into some certain problems that I'll show you later. Now, at MIT, we had an all-day meeting. Uh, the morning belonged to the Can We Do It group. They were making up ideas. I know what we could do. We could do this, and we could use this leverage, and we could make the planet do that. And the afternoon was Should We Try? And that was the group I was in. And I did a takeoff on the, this was the logo from the meeting. Uh, sort of a male hand, like godlike in scale, was reaching up to nowhere to turn the thermostat. And the, uh, uh, the implication is that there is a planetary thermostat and maybe some climate scientists could figure out what it is and then we could turn the thermostat back to where it should be. Uh, the thermostat is nowhere. The temperature on the thermostat is 73 Fahrenheit, ter being turned back to 54 on the image. And uh, that's cooler than the Earth's long-term average. So the, the male, the, the, the giant hand might have overdone it and given us something like, uh, like uh, a, a nice uh, covered planet if you turn it that far back. 
And then I looked really closely, and in the middle of that image, the thermostat dial is centered on Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, that's not, I, I don't think it's an accident. I think that the fellow that ran the meeting said, oh, I just took a picture of my hand and I put it up and I made a poster. But there's meaning behind these things that uh, communicates different things to different people. And so geoengineering ideas. Now, I don't know how much you've heard about this. <laughs> heard that? Uh, geoengineering is a neologism. It did not exist in the Oxford English Dictionary until very recently. Uh, if you look into the Urban Dictionary, you'll find it. And it says, uh, the last de gasp of a dying civilization, uh, geo <laughs> geo geotechnical tinkering, uh, speculation. Uh, it's not a thing. It's, an, it's a set of ideas or suite of possibilities like uh, space mirrors. I went to a meeting in 2006, and they said, well, let's launch with a rail gun. Let's put up a whole bunch of space mirrors. And that's incredible. You'd have this sort of ominous cloud come across the sun. It would be at the Outer Space um, Agency helping to m moderate the sunlight. And the intent was to offset greenhouse gas warming by solar radiation management, they called it. Another way would be to put aerosols, which are highly reflected into the stratosphere, by various mechanisms. I'll show you one pretty soon. Uh, there's an older one called cloud seeding, which harkens back to the old weather control tropes of the 1940s, where Irving Langmuir wanted to control hurricanes and he make, make uh, the climate change. Uh, there's things like growing trees, but here's the iron fertilization. Uh, you, uh, we call that geritol for the oceans. You put that iron in. And actually, it was a Colby graduate, John Martin, who came up with this idea at uh, Moss, Moss Landing. And he said, uh, kind of in a, it was said that he said it in a Dr. Strangelove accent, give me an iron tanker full of iron filings and I'll give you an ice age. And we can control the planet with uh, iron, which is the limiting nutrient in marine. You guys are marine specialists, aren't you? You know about this stuff, right? Well, you can find, ask your professors. Uh, and then you can pump it into the deep ocean. You can pump it underground. I mean, there's all kind of uh, mechanisms. This family of this thing is called geoengineering. And if you ever go to a geoengineering meeting, the first thing you discuss is, let's get rid of the term geoengineering. Let's just talk about the techniques. And we broke our report into two different sides. The one was up here with the sunlight, and one was down there with, this, with the capture and sequestration. The current carbon thing, well, that's kind of another thing. Uh, <coughs> and the godfather behind this is actually Edward Teller, uh, the modern incarnation of this. It has a long history. But uh, we went to this NASA Ames meeting about climate engineering. And Teller had passed away. But his chief disciple, uh, Lowell Wood, was there. And Wood is a very uh, aggressive kind of big bear of a man. He's, he's dropped out of the conversation quite a bit recently, but he co-authored a paper uh, with Teller called The Planet Needs a Sunscreen. And this is sort of like too much radiation, too much warming, we can fix it. It comes out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory where people think they have the answer to big uh, over-the-top challenges. And they're, they'll, uh, so I if this engineering ever came about, it might come from a national lab. It might come from the Department of Energy, what may be the old Department of Energy. Uh, but um, this, this was a little bit ominous to me. So I go in there as a former uh, atmospheric scientist, climatologist, a current historian of science. I give a lecture on weather mod, and I hear all these wild ideas. And I said, this is really low-hanging fruit for a, for a science studies person, for somebody that looks at the history and sociology of science. This is just too good. So I, I took my existing writing on weather control and I linked it to final chapters on militarizing uh, the planet and uh, terraforming the Earth and uh, climate control. Um, Wood was on the cover of uh, Rolling Stone magazine that, that month. It was November 2006 when this got started. And uh, he was called Dr. Evil in the, in the magazine. And uh, so that caused a little bit of a kerfluffle. And we had the, the Rolling Stone magazine there. It was all very sort of serious stuff, but kind of pop culture because here's our one of our protagonists in the meeting on the on the not on the cover but in, inside Rolling Stone. Uh, he had a proposal. He called it Pump It Up, Spew It Out was the name of his paper. I did some things on that in the book which you'll, you'll have to read because uh, maybe I shouldn't tell you all that stuff. Uh, but there's a high altitude aero balloon and it's a military balloon. Uh, it flies somewhere at the edge of the troposphere, probably in the stratosphere, 
and it has a sort of a, a lift cap capacity. He wanted to put a long hose up there from the surface, maybe a, a well, you'd need about a 15 kilometer hose to pump up sulfates and have it spew out through some nozzles up there. And he said, it's all physics. We put that stuff up there, we spew it out, and the earth cools up. And so one of my friends was the <coughs> world's expert in volcanology. And he said, mm, it's not quite that easy. And some of the other people in the group were more trained in weather and things. And they said, well, what about icing on the hose? Or what if it decouples? And what if, what if a 15 kilometer long sort of macrophallic hose starts falling <laughs> out of the sky, <laughs> spewing sulfates? What, what are you saying to the world? That, and, um, and the balloon has a, a, a ground position error or uh, uncertainty of a, you know, about 10 kilometers. You, you, with the winds changing, you're not quite sure where the balloon's going to be on a given day. So there's a real good chance that you would have decoupling of that hose. And when uh, my friend was talking about how hard it would be to make an actual artificial volcano, Wood stood up in the meeting, full height, he's about 6'6", six, six, he's about 300 pounds, and he stood up, it was, he was two seats from me, he stood up and it was a square uh, open meeting, 20 people, and he said, sit down, shut up, I'm right, you're wrong, it's all physics. And it was that attitude that I know the physics, I'm going to make a, 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 a gizmo that's going to cool the planet, I know it'll work, you're a volcanologist, what do you know? And that kind of exchange was the most dramatic I'd ever seen in my life. I tried to represent it a bit, that, that narrative aspect of the, the confrontation, the passion, the, the certainty that they were right. And then I found in the New York Times this, Henning, uh, this German cartoonist uh, had captured the moment kind of in a one panel cartoon. I, t I tend to like one panel cartoons. These were, the caption here is like two overheated polar bears uh, desperately uh, trying to protect their shrinking ice flow by uh, pumping sulfur above their heads and they're trying to keep this hose up while the, the, the nondescript military uh, naval vessels are back here possibly shooting more sulfates into the stratosphere. Or maybe it's the Russian Navy trying to keep the Arctic open um, because there's geopolitics of the Arctic where we assume everybody wants more ice but there are people in the world that want to have a Northwest Passage and they want to have a straight line to China for commerce. And so uh, the one panel thing, uh, I did a, uh, had a lot of fun with this. I hope, I hope you're having a little fun. It's lunchtime, and I'm trying to keep it light. But these are Rube Goldberg <laughs> devices, and I, I really do believe that many of them are, this is a mouse trap. Mouse uh, hits the uh, canvas, thinks it's a cheese, uh, lands on a hot plate, uh, gets burned and jumps up the stairway, gets punched by the boxing glove and then lands here and is shoot, shot into space by the rocket. This is the, this is the kind of uh, Rube Goldberg uh, mechanisms that sometimes I was hearing. Railgun in the Andes, sloped up and shoots a uh, space flyer into space. Space flyer dims the sun, making people happy because that stops global warming. It's, it's, it's like the Rube Goldberg uh, chain of events that would have to happen for any of this to work. And, uh, Again, I could go on and on about every detail of every one of these things, but y I think you get the idea that uh, it was not fully thought through with consequences, costs, material. We did a thing on the, uh, on the Critson proposal. We, we calculated how many naval guns it would take more than exist, uh, how much gun cotton it would take more than we have in the world, uh, how much tropospheric pollution it would cost to shoot these guns more than you'd ever want to imagine just to get the sulfates up there. And uh, then you don't have the permission of the tropical countries where you're opening fire on the stratosphere. So wh what, is a, what is a military solution to a problem? It can come down to a simple open fire on it or shoot at, shoot it. And so uh, they, the, the mindset was very engineering, very physics-based, and very much uh, open fire with military equipment if we're gonna stop global warming. And that's n I don't think that's the uh, value set that, that this audience has right now. So uh, Alan Robach, my friend, who was the volcanologist, world experts on, vo on volcanoes, he'd studied all the, studied Pinatuba and the metaphor of uh, cooling off uh, the earth. Uh, Pinatuba cooled us off a couple degrees. But he, he had a list, he had 19 reasons. He has, who has the moral right? Uh, who could make a global thermostat? Uh, could this uh, 
reduce incentives to actually mitigate our carbon use and what would be the side effects. There's, there's a lot you can read faster than I could read them. But I added number 10. I added 10, which would be, would climate engineering alter our basic relationships with nature? Would we think, this isn't the main climate. Somebody's pulling levers out there. Some government agency has changed it. And there's a good uh, history of that, that people were concerned about weather modification, whether their weather was natural or was human made. And if we do this, we start messing with the, uh, the uh, here's one, uh, where was the, uh, oh, there's one here about the, the, the blue sky would not exist. It would be more milky white. And I've heard arguments, well, well milky white might be a good trade-off for global warming, because who looks at the sky anyway? Or losing track of the Milky Way, not being able to see be below fifth magnitude stars might be okay too, because uh, people sit in cities and watch uh, you, you know, uh, YouTube and stuff, and they, they don't go out at night and see the sky anyway. You can't see it in Los Angeles. And so uh, there's, there's these aesthetic reasons, and there's a number of concerns about uh, militarization. I'll, I'll, I'll try to touch on that a little bit later. I want to be careful for time because I know you all have to get on to your next thing. Uh, Robach had a, he, there, there is a model comparison thing called GeoMips and the GeoMips is a computer, a set of computer modelers who put experimental amounts of sulfate into their digital models and they see what might happen. And this is an early run of it where the brown <coughs> represents drying. It's not all about temperature here. So you put in this much sulfate, you put in the Arctic, you put three megatons of sulfate in and you run the model, and you end up with this whole drying across the, the lower tier of, uh, of nations, across the, really across the, uh, uh, the Indian monsoon would be damaged, the, uh, the Indonesian rainfall in the model would be damaged. And so you end up with a haves cooling the northern hemisphere and a group of have-nots getting their precipitation damaged. And I've actually heard people not trained in ethics but saying that might be another trade-off. And it's uh, a very sad uh, s state of affairs with cost-benefit analysis where the argument is your cost, my benefit, balances out, let's do it. And that's it's completely wrong to think this way. Uh, this is not a completely robust result, but run after run shows a kind of a, a volcanoes do affect the, the uh, rainfall in the, in the tropics. So I came out of the meeting, this is all from 2006, the back of the envelope's not good enough uh, you can't just take out a pencil and make a couple, uh, not even equations, but uh, amounts of sulfate you might need. Simple computer models aren't good enough either because a lot of the people were not the model makers. And I thought that, that NASA or the DOE should not be sponsoring this, but it should get out more to the public. So I felt, I actually felt motivated that I had a mission to tell the world more about this, not in technical ways, but in ways that might affect them historically, aesthetically, uh, emotionally. Uh, and so I wrote the uh, climate engineers. This is the, the URL, and I think you can have access to that free copy. It pretty much says what the book says very quickly. <laughs> and uh, they, they, this is what they, they, they got an artist, this is called the Green Goo cover, and they got an angry uh, geoengineer illustrated shooting green goo and fighting against the sunlight. And I came back from the meeting and gave a talk uh, about this. And I'm not much of a cartoonist, but I could do a little uh, Photoshop. And I had this meeting at NASA. Um, anyway, there's more about it, but I, I just said, well, if your planet's too warm, why don't you cut off some sunbeams? And this was my, this is my take on the, on the Rube Goldberg aspect of, of geoengineering. I think they were down the fire road the other day trying to keep the lines clear. <laughs> All right, so uh, have I got your interest yet? Okay. Uh, there's more, and I'll go quickly. From the National Academies report, it's 2015, free, PDF. You just tell them you're a student, or tell them you're gonna use it in class, and you download the whole thing. This is the PDF horizon I was talking about. Full color. Uh, mitigation is plan A. It doesn't, the Royal Society had this thing called plan B for the climate. It was geoengineering. And that's when we got into this tiff with the, uh, the uh, uh, House Committee on Science and Technology, and I said there is no Plan B. Plan B is a bucket of, of proposals. And none, of, none of them would pop, probably work without vast side effects. So mitigation is still Plan A from the Academy. Adaptation is uh, the second in, in, in line. And we were talking this morning about resilience and, and, and being able to uh, 
adjust your lifestyle to the changing climate, but reducing carbon dioxide emissions, uh, capturing and safe storage, I'm not against at all, and then adaptation. But albedo modification at scale sufficient to alter the climate is, uh, should not be deployed. This was our conclusion. It was, I was the only uh, social scientist, really, and there was a whole bunch of climate people on the, on the panel. And uh, actually, uh, the, the, chair, the current chair of the National Academy, Marsha McNutt, was a chair of our panel. And we got her to basically admit that this is not engineering, this is intervention. Uh, this is not precision, like, the, like I was saying about the eyes. I would sign off to get LASIK eye surgery, maybe, but I couldn't sign off for the planet. Maybe it would, it would be pretty tough to get a, co a consensus to do that. And then geoengineering should now be called climate intervention and solar radiation management which was a neologism back in 06, <coughs> was now getting renamed into albedo modification. <coughs> Management was too, in a way, uh, technical of a term. Uh, geez, I guess I'm gonna run through really quickly. I, I traced some of this in the book back to the, the early disgracers. This is uh, Helios' son. Anybody study the classics? Phaeton wanted to drive his dad's sun chariot through the heavens across the ecliptic. And uh, Helios said, well, I don't know if I should agree, but I promised you one wish. And so go ahead, hold on to the reins, follow the middle path, hold on tightly. Everything went wrong. The horses went wild. This is, Fa this is Zeus shooting Phaeton out of the sky. There's the, the chariot, and the horses are not having a good time. And if you're, so if you go back and read about this, uh, Phaeton's blunder, you can get a sense of the human uh, aspiration, but also hubris to think that they could do something to control the sun. Uh, historically, getting out of the, the mythology land, but historically, this was our first national meteorologist, James Espy. I wrote a lot about him earlier, and he was the actual founder of the convective theory of storms. So the convective theory says that heated air rises, rising air cools, cooling air will condense any moisture in it, and it'll rain. And that was his theory. It was a very good theory, 1830s. He wrote a book called Philosophy of Storms in which he said we could make it rain more if we lit giant fires and became more like artificial volcanoes. The humans could become those people who stimulate the convection. So how are we going to do that? Well, we cut down gigantic woodlots along the Appalachian Ridge, and every Sunday afternoon we just torch them. And we make gigantic fires that run from Maine to Georgia, and that'll make gigantic clouds, and that'll make fresh rain to the to the east well people said this guy's barking mad <laughs> <laughs> and my, my friend my friend has uh, m developed this meme with, with slate magazine P uh, ray pierre humbert was on our committee and uh he accused current engineers of being barking mad i simply accuse dead people who were part of the past who were good but at this point in, in Espy's career he was thought to be kind of really out there really crazy eliza leslie wrote about this in 1842. She wrote about the world of the future in 1942. She wrote about Espy's great-grandnephew as a fictional character who could control the rain so he could pull the lever in Philadelphia in 1942. And uh, this, the basic story was, and I, for interest of time, was anybody who could control the weather would not make anybody else happy. People that thought it was natural now would suspect that somebody else had got their way that somebody else was controlling the weather. <coughs> and then, uh, again, because of the constraints, I, I, I want you all to go out and put a hold on the library book and read more about it, but uh, this is a picture of our technologies approximately 1945. This is a picture of technologies that empowered people to think they really could control the weather, not just by lighting big woodlots on the Appalachian Trail, or by using specially electrified airplanes like they did in the 1920s, or burning petroleum. They, there was a big project in World War II to burn petrol to raise the fogs in Britain, like a, like a bathroom uh, hair dryer would clean the fog out of your mirror. They would light gigantic pools of petrol to get the aviators back from, from uh, Germany. But in 1945, we got this world-changing technology called nuclear weapons. We were testing them in the, in, the, in the Pacific and then in Nevada. We also had uh, RCA and uh, some of the early pioneers of computing saying we could make a perfect computer. There was no sense that there was a limit to computational accuracy then. And if we made a perfect computer, you could say, well, uh, we're gonna have uh, 
snow flurries on Saturday, but they're going to start here in Biddeford at 1.43 p.m. And they're going to continue and end at 3.58 p.m. And it's going to be exactly this amount. And so if you wanted to intervene in that snowstorm, you could send a team out to do something. And it was connected with the deep uh, decommissioning of the, of the military in 1945. And so RCA, perfect computer, send people out, especially in Florida, you could go down and burn petrol across the oceans and maybe steer a hurricane offshore. There's all kinds of proposals from both popular and scientific sources. Irving Langmuir, the Nobel laureate, was cloud seeding. They were seeding hurricanes. They were seeding the desert southwest. And they were hoping to seed the Pacific to make a very large array that would actually maybe cause something like an El Nino. You could make the Pacific do what you wanted with enough silver iodide chemical. And then we had rockets. And there was a proposal, a serious proposal, to cut a hole in the ozone layer. You know about ozone depletion. Well, they wanted to cut one for the astronomers so they could see through it. They were going to cut it over Chile, over a big observatory. They were going to do it at night, and they were going to make the hole last only for a couple hours so the astronomers could use those wavelengths to see through it. They were going to shoot up a bromine bomb. And then my, my, one of the protagonists in the book got worried that uh, maybe the military wants to make a giant bromine bomb Maybe they would want to destroy the ozone layer over some antagonistic country. Let's see, what would that be? Maybe like the Soviet Union. They have high latitude infrastructure. So that, that was really a, a, a moment here, way before, actually way before, a decade before the Nobel Prize winning equations of uh, Molina and Roland and uh, Critson on ozone depletion. So there's a standard history of ozone depletion, and then there's an engineering history where they knew what they thought they could do with bromine. Then there was uh, the story of nukes in space. If you'd like to hear that, uh, hang around at the reception. <laughs> and, uh, and then there was the, we came to a Tyros moment. where, it, When Tyros was launched, <coughs> the, one of the chief scientists said, we aspire to understand everything atmospheric, everywhere, always. That was the phrase. Every, it was total panoptic understanding of the atmosphere would be given to us by satellites. Total computational knowledge would be given by the computers. Total you know, imp input of force. We get new hurricanes. We, we just find the little critters out there in the Caribbean. We get to them with our bombers. And there's a Disney film on this if you want to see it. We can go out and intervene. There's, a, there's even a Russian film strip from 1960. It says, what will the world be like in 2017? Why 2017? the centennial of the Russian Revolution. We will be living under the Arctic. We will be controlling tornadoes. We'll be weather heroes. They won't, it'll be general weather, not just captain weather. They'll be going out <coughs> to intervene. And this whole intervention <coughs> game of the post, you talk about post-war war, post history, Cold War history, it comes out of these technologies. Now we have, we have nukes. We have better computers. We have, still have cloud seeding, not federally. We still have rockets, and we have uh, satellites. Even go the new GOES is a great satellite. But what, what we don't have is perfect control, perfect provision. And so I, I refer to that as, as the UPC of science, understanding, prediction, and control. Jump too, too quickly, we jump to control. And right now, uh, we're not ready to control the planet. Swerkin did this with his outline of a weather proposal. Um, there's a bu bunch of scenarios. This comes from Collier's Magazine where uh, there is a, an attack here across the plains of Eastern Europe. Uh, the jets are sent out, but they're not uh, attack jets. They're seeding planes that put in the little time-release balloons. The balloons go off. The, the pilots are back home safe, but the clouds get seeded by this t uh, technique, Collier's Magazine, and the clouds grow, and they get angry, and they become cumulonimbus clouds here, eventually off to the east. And the lightning, this, this is actually your, uh, your college logo, isn't it, right here? The, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> although it's not a nor'easter. Uh, and then if you zoom in on that cloud, you get the, the cloud hitting the lead tank in the column. So they're taking out the tank with precision. The, the, the motif is precision. Uh, Langmuir intervened in, in Hurricane King off the coast of Florida. They went out and, they, and, the, and the Air Force put uh, dry ice into the hurricane in 1947. And they thought they were going to change its direction out to sea. They were going to make it weaker. But what actually happened was the prevailing conditions brought the storm onshore. And it, uh, it en ended up uh, hitting uh, Savannah, Georgia, and killing some people. So, so the press 
the press uh, release, that, I mean the, the uh, press conference that was being scheduled right after the run was canceled. And I found this material in an archive that had been declassified only as of 1993. It was just kind of put into a big drawer in Washington and said, well, that didn't really happen. But Langmuir kept talking about it and he made the cover of Time for his weather control. This is not the way you want to make the cover of Time. <laughs> you don't want to be cartooned and buffooned on the weather on the cover of Time. And he was a Nobel laureate in surface chemistry. He made smoke screens for the military in World War II and he made this weather control technology kind of possible in the 1950s and then he was deemed barking mad. <laughs> so the, the warning to current engineers, I gave this talk once, or a similar talk to the, to the people in, uh, who were engineers and I never attacked them personally. I just said historians are going to take a, a, a close look at your work in the future. Okay, and then, oh, should I do this? I just skip over this part, right? No? Okay. Donald, uh, this is D Disney, 1953. Again, the cartoonists jump in there. They make up the storyline where Donald Duck is a rainmaker. He's giving, r he's got a bag of rain seed and the farmer wants to have two inches of rain on his barley field. And, he, and Donald gives him a good deal. So he goes up and cuts some beautiful clouds. This is a cartoon panels of precision. Donald shapes the clouds perfectly. He lets the rain fall only on the barley field. Even the half raindrop doesn't go on the other farmer's land. So it's, it's a trope about precision where he gets two inches to the millimeter. If you're into scientific uh, measurements, you know what that means. Uh, so he, he's very happy with the commercial, this is commercial rain making. There's a commercial side of, to this technology. Then there's Donald always gets mad. He always blows his top. He's, that's just what Donald does. And uh, Daisy's out philandering with another duck, and they're having a picnic, and Donald's cut out of the scene. So he goes out, and he gets mad, and he, he takes his rain seat up there to make a militarization of the clouds. He gives them a blizzard. He blows away their picnic. He overseeds the clouds through the canyon. He's roaring up there really, really mad. It says rain, hail, snow, blizzard, and there's Donald. And uh, he oversees the clouds and makes a big ice storm over the canyon, which then falls down, crushes the cars. It doesn't hurt anybody because it's Disney. <laughs> and <laughs> it crashes into the cars. And then they're trying to figure out who did that. Who did that? How did that duck know the clouds were made out of ice? And, and Donald's sneaking away in denial. And one of the tropes of uh, weather control is that you could deny it. I if those clouds went across Eastern Europe and, and caused mud to fall, and, and, and the lightning struck the, the, the Soviet tank, you would say, oh, that's too bad, you had bad weather. Not that we caused it, you have to preserve deniability. So uh, Uncle Donald goes off to Timbuktu. Is that what it's yeah, Timbuktu. That, I think there's a branch campus of UNE at Timbuktu. <laughs> opening up soon right there. Uh, but but the, the, the story, if you read the whole panel, it's Donald Duck, Master Rainmaker from 1953. And I didn't bring the Disney movie, but here's the Russians we're talking about making. This is a a blossoming tulip over the Arctic Circle, an open Arctic cities blossoming around the Arctic Rim, and a gigantic, this is a, a rocket taking the, uh, uh, particles up to make a Saturn's ring around the Earth. So there was a, not a serious proposal, but there was a book about making a, a ring around the planet, and if you tipped it just right, it would illuminate the ice over the Arctic and it would melt it out. About 1960. Again, this kind of Russian uh, fantasy is covered in the book. There's the 2017 film strip, uh, the year 2017. In the year 2017, when we celebrate the grand uh, anniversary of the revolution, we will live under the Arctic in cities that are buried under the ice, but it'll be very nice because of the, the superpower we can use down, down under there. We'll also make uh, special weather control flying machines that are, are, uh, can go out and take out a hurricane. In this case, they, in the story, they take out a bunch of uh, uh, nasty uh, tornadoes of the Black Sea. And then, so there's a heroic uh, uh, storyline. I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here pretty soon because uh, there was actual, ge I've been talking about proposals the whole time. I'm talking about SB proposing to burn the Appalachians and Teller proposing to have a sunscreen for the planet. And this is actually what happened. Um, 1958, James Van Allen discovered the magnetosphere. So the first U.S. satellite discovered something brand new about the planet. The second, the third one too, it sort of reinforced the idea that we have a magnetic sphere 
circling the planet. The, we didn't know that. And the same day they announced it uh, to the to the uh, to the National Academy, Van Allen agreed to blow it up with the military, a test in, in the magnetosphere. And so uh, this is uh, this is Ernie Ray, one of his associates, on the blackboard at Iowa University, 1958 Gamma. That's the third uh, Alpha Beta Gamma. That's the third satellite. The second one blew up. Space is radioactive. Now you know from Captain Kirk that space is the final frontier, and you know that uh, space is a vast vacuum. But space is radioactive. That got the military really interested because these were radioactive particles circling in the magnetosphere, or they were they were electrons. So we could add more electrons to it with a nuclear test. So they tried it, and they went up. Uh, oh, sorry, this guy's already barking mad. Uh, <laughs> gave away my punchline. But um, Nicholas Christophilus, who is my, my version of Edward Teller Light or Dr. Strangelove from Berkeley, was giving a talk out there about weaponizing the magnetosphere. And he, he asked actually that the, the project was called Argus. Two, three A-bombs shot over the South Atlantic into the very high altitude to see what would happen. Now this very Baconian, if you study Francis Bacon, you've got to torture nature to, to ha have her reveal her secrets. And one way to torture it was to go ahead and discover something and then try to blow it up. So one of the standard experimental methods of science is to cut things apart or blow things up or crash particles together and see what the debris is. And so Christophilus is giving a lecture about the Earth and its magnetis magnetic bands. And what he's saying here, and I have the, the transcript that goes with this picture, if you set off a high altitude nuclear test in, say, the South Atlantic, the lines of magnetic force would be such that it would cause a hell of an EMP over Moscow. So they could weaponize this notion of the magnetosphere. They could either set off the bombs above our own cities so that the Russian bombers couldn't get through the debris, or they could knock out the Russian bombers with bombs, or they could make an EMP, or they could knock out radio communication with a big bomb, which is exactly what they did in 1962 with a project called uh, uh, Starfish Prime. This is over the Pacific. They shot Starfish Prime, uh, they announced it ahead of time. They shot this bomb off way above the Pacific Ocean uh, between Johnston Island and Hawaii, and it wiped out the radio traffic across the Pacific for 48 hours. Nobody could reach New Zealand, nobody could reach Australia, uh, and so there was a, just a shh across the Pacific. And the first message through to Johnston Island, they thought they had killed themselves. They said, the, the Pentagon got a message to Johnson Island, are you still there? And then they got a little record re response back. And the people in Hawaii went up on the hillsides and they actually scheduled what they called rainbow bomb parties. Uh, is anybody here in like American studies or in cultural studies or? They actually served specially mixed drinks with little rainbow nukes on, on for, the, for the swizzle sticks. <laughs> They would sit out on the on the port. Maybe this has had to do with tourist history, if they had special cruise ships. But the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, announced the test. People went out to watch the test, and then the, the EMP from that bomb knocked out their garage door openers and their traffic lights in Honolulu. These are heavy switching materials that were knocked out by EMP from that test. And uh, and also they they called the light show the Aurora Tropicalis. It was a human-made aurora. Now that is geoengineering. It's not geoengineering for climate, it's geoengineering for military purposes, to tinker with the magnetosphere. Ben Allen actually said later in life, he said, I wish we hadn't had blown that H-bomb up in the magnetosphere because it ruined the natural magnetosphere for 10 years. There was no more measurements that could be taken that were background measurements after that bomb. And that was 62, it was only four years after the discovery. <laughs> there we go. Now you know why I put that on there. And so there's Starfish Prime, the Aurora Tropicalis. Uh, I, have a, I have a paper on that. I'll send it to you if you write to me. And so uh, I went to the, another meeting recently. They were trying to make a, a policy regime for geoengineering. And they were saying from the front podium, we don't have a history of geoengineering. And I said, yes, we do. And <laughs> I was kind of being like a, uh, telling them some things they maybe have knew but didn't want to hear. Things are moving so quickly, we don't have the luxury of looking at history. They, they have this urgency thing. We've got to make these geoengineering techniques so they work so we can save the planet. 
take the time. I, I suggested between 40 minutes for the article and uh, three or four hours for the book, or maybe a little bit longer if you want to enjoy it more. But you, you don't have to become a historian. You just have to be open to the notion that this stuff has been thought about, proposed, and even tried in the past. And we don't want to get into that repeating the history that we already know. And we are the first generation to think about this. This was the back in the 2006, uh, 2000, it was 2010, and the big word was unprecedented. Everything's unprecedented. And that's where I came up with my personal motto that everything's unprecedented if you don't study history. And so history says it's not unprecedented. There are people that thought about tinkering with the planet, and the Research Council did that too. That there's the re reference to the 2015. So I'm going to wind it up here. Uh, thank you for your attention because uh, uh, the Earth is at a tipping point, but Archimedes is not the m model for that because if Archimedes has a place to stand and a lever long enough to move the Earth, I, I heard an engineer once talk about this being technology and this being sort of like space capacities to move the Earth. The tipping point is a metaphor for climate too. We're at the tipping point. And I just ask, you know, where would it roll if you tip it? So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs> and I'm, it's before 1 o'clock. Yeah, I, I think if people have questions, uh, we'll have to do that. Questions, comments? Like announcements? No, you don't, you don't have to. You don't have to? No, I don't. There, there are papers, there are advocates that I, uh, a multiple scattered light is good for plants and that plants get their photosynthesis uh, not only from direct solar but from scattered solar. So there are some studies about, and there's studies about engineering, genetic engineering is actually linked to climate change in, in some narratives. And one would be Bill McKibben's early book, you know, Death of Nature, does that kind of thing. But, uh, there, is a, there was a semi-serious argument that this could be good for agriculture. If we, if we make the sky milky white instead of uh, a shining spot and, and nice and blue. And there's another argument against it that says, well, if you make a big solar array, you're going to reduce the efficiency of these solar collectors that do that are engineered to run on direct solar because you'll have more scattered solar. So they're, they're back and forth. But the plants are in the mix now. And there's a, the, geo, the genetic engineering was aimed at making uh, crops brighter, make, sort of like the, like the cover the earth with white paint, like the Sherwin Williams thing. Uh, but instead of paint, you use a brighter crop. Maybe you make soybeans that are genetically modified to have brighter leaves and so give you a better uh, reflectivity. So there, there is literature. I've never, I've never heard anybody talk seriously about it, but I do know there is some, some stuff on that. And there's a great big, if you want to go to Berlin, there's a great big geoengineering conference in October. And so uh, uh, the Journal of Tur Tourism History is going to sponsor a trip to Berlin <laughs> <laughs> for the geoengineers. It's, it's a wild meeting. Over here. So sort of related to what Beth you just asked, at these geoengineering meetings, are there any ecologists that attend these sessions? Because it seems to me that the engineers and the ecologists don't seem to be talking to each other. There's a lot of complexity in ecology, and I think um, even biologists sort of poo-poo ecology as, okay, well, well, we might get to that by the end of the semester if we have time, but that's the simple stuff. Where I think, in reality, it's probably as complicated or more complicated than any of the rest of biology. 
And so I'm wondering, are those conversations part of this? Is your background in college? Yes. yes. <laughs> I just wonder if you're coming to Berlin with us. So. Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> uh, no, there, there are, uh, no, there, there's not a very uh, robust spread of disciplines, uh, but there, like I said, there's literature on this. I haven't been to enough meetings to know, uh, but you know, the, the origins of chaos theory comes out of uh, tipping points in, uh, in ecological systems too, you know. I don't know the history as well as I should, but uh, there's this introduced species idea, what could possibly go wrong while well, the, the rats could kill all the birds, the snakes could kill the birds, and this, uh, especially on island communities, that kind of literature. And so I, I think that my friend Alan Robach was playing that role as an atmospheric scientist, saying that an artificial volcano, a Pinatuba, actually changed the rainfall across the planet. And Pinatuba actually damaged the ozone layer as well as cooling the planet. And, and there, there are proposals, so I deal mostly on the physical atmospheric science side of things, but there are proposals like let's get rid of cirrus clouds because cirrus clouds help heat the climate. Or at least, so that there's this like ban, ban cirrus clouds. You get, get it like little cirrus clouds with an X on it. And I said, well, what else do cirrus clouds do? They play other functions, including aesthetic functions in the sky. But they also play, play a role in the rain cycle of, of, of making clouds build up. So, uh, so certainly this kind of discourse has to get much broader. A good critique can come from ecology, that's for sure. Yes? Student question. Oh, they'll go ahead. I don't mean to control them. I don't see them. I guess we're all students. We're all students. Um, so if there's no way to geoengineer and repair something, and we have to reduce emissions, what is your take on what I see as mainly economic disincentives to build the solar? We are so wedded to oil for, for correctable reasons, economic reasons. Right. Uh, I, I agree. I think we have an engineering future, small e, lots of different ideas, how to make a good solar collector, how to make a clean carburetor, how to reduce dependence on oil. But I don't think we have a geoengineering robust future for the big E or the big GE. It's this, this image on the cover of the book about uh, the technocrat pulling the lever, controlling, this is from 1954, the technocrat pulling the lever and making things happen and automatically changing things with a big leverage point. That's the kind of engineering I would push back against and say, have you thought about the social and ecological consequences? But the small engineering, I think we are going to end up, we're going to end up with a more managed planet. We're going to end up with a better, more engineering in our planet, more Internet of Things if, if we can protect it from hacking, you know. And, um, and it, the small E, I'm certainly in, in favor of clean air, quieter cities, cooling off the climate to the best of our ability, minimizing human influence. So the, the two narratives are not opposed to each other. Is it oversimplifying to say that hasn't happened much yet because of non-scientific reasons, because of economic reasons, subsidizing oil companies and all of that is keeping us from, I mean, most of us got here in our cars. I guess what I'm saying I, is... I fill up once a month. I got a hybrid, and whether I need it or not, I But you still fill up. I do. And, and you still drive a non And I will drive at 60 miles an hour in an electric car if they make one that doesn't yeah. burn up. I know. I guess what I'm saying is, um, in my amateurish view of this, it seems like the biggest hurdle is we don't want to switch it over. We don't want to create the economic incentives to fully develop solar power. Right. I think we, well, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are switching over. It's just not that kind yes. of just throwing the switch. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the hubris and the, uh, the, the, the arrogant actor trying to do something and not, not knowing the consequences, the, the, the low wood kind of approach. And I'm not as concerned. I'm, I'm concerned about the pace of the other things. So you're optimistic. I am optimistic. And so gloom and doom, I, I, you want another lecture about how to respond to the Anthropocene, we can hang around. But gloom and doom are not going to do it. And denial is not going to do it. And cultural suicide is not going to do it. And, uh, and uh, um, hedonism is not going to do it. But how would you respond if you think the world's coming to an end by 2050 or 2100? 
we, we were having we had a bunch of geoengineers. With, it's like sounds like a joke, you know, a bunch of engineers sitting around having dinner. This actually happened, and they're pretty high gluten not engineers. And uh, we were having some wine and dinner, and they were talking about, oh, I think the world's going to end in 2050, and the others said, no, I think it's going to be 2100. And I said, excuse me, but what would you do between now and then if you think the end of the world's coming? And the response I got was, oh, Jim, that's the wine talking. <laughs> but but you, you got to take it seriously. You know? What's, what's a 22-year-old going to do if you think the world's going to end? I mean, if the gloom and doom narrative becomes your primary consciousness, if it's 57 varieties of pollution, if, if I write a new book called Fixing Everything rather than Fixing the Sky, if, if everything's going to hell, what do you do in the next 25 to 50 years? You could become culturally suicidal, or you could become a think tank. You could become a community of solutions, a community of people that both personally and through, through your alliances and your activities, whatever else you do, you, you, you make it so things turn out, turn out better. And then if we go to hell, then that's, <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> no, but it's, there's a serious uh, psychological aspect to climate change. If you, you buy the narrative and get frozen into inaction, that's one of the worst things that could happen too. Uh, you keep talking about all the things we can put in the atmosphere to fix the problem. What about the center of their effort to maybe just get the carbon out of the atmosphere and remove things? What kind of effort are we doing there? Uh, the, uh, the second volume of that report was focused on carbon capture and safe, reliable storage. And uh, my colleague Jennifer Wilcox has written a book called Carbon Capture. Uh, an interesting thing to read. But I asked her, I said, what about long-term storage? And so our committee ran up against the barrier where if you capture on a planetary scale all the emissions of carbon dioxide in the world, and, and it's like more than three times more than the carbon we use because it's oxidized, and how do you purify it, pump it, put it underground, put it in the oceans, put it somewhere? How do you keep it there? for more than a millennium. We don't have any institutions that have ever done that. The Catholic Church is an old institution, but they were never into carbon storage. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an article, there's a special issue of a journal by a guy named Toth, T-H-O-T-H. -H. He wrote about the comparison between carbon storage and uh, nuclear waste disposal. And he actually said that nuclear waste disposal might be a, a bit easier, because at least it decays and it's not the same volume as all the carbon. So the, the, the experimental stages now, there's people making artificial trees, there's people making carbon scrubbers, there's people looking into the ocean iron fertilization mechanisms. Uh, there, there are approaches, but uh, they're all very, very, very minuscule, and they're not at the scale that we would need to uh, decarbonize the, the, the world system. Uh, there, there's metaphors, we, we kind of desulfurize the world. We, we were able to reduce a lot of high sulfur fuel, and we were able to take out certain elements from our fuel supply, you know, like lead. But this is a much bigger thing with many more sources that, oh, we were able to take out CFCs by a treaty. But it's a much bigger thing to talk about carbon, which is the, the plant food of life, as well as the, the global pollutants. And it, it, you know, if you just, my proposal, <laughs> My proposal was to put little markers on just the fossil carbon and, and make just fossil CO2 a special chemical marker. Tongue in cheek. Uh, and, and then put little, little, uh, put little nano springs on the, on the molecules so they don't rotate or vibrate anymore. And then they would be uh, radiatively neutral. That is a complete farce. But, but, <laughs> but you can get in certain circles and talk like that and people say, yeah, nanotechnology, that might suck. That might save us, but the, the the serious answer is, it's a very very large scale capture problem. It's a very large scale uh, thermodynamic issue, a very large scale economic issue, and it's a very large scale storage and safe maintenance issue. So the cascade of those gigantic issues means that we have a long long way to go. And if you go too quickly, the the, the, the groups that are scaled up to maybe pump and store things turn out to be the major oil companies problem. That can make that much piping, you know. You end up with, you know, 
with the Dakota Access Pipeline, this is going to be much bigger because there are going to be pipelines to put it into storage facilities. So you end up with the social consequences being very big too. So that's, that's a place where I'm not so uh, sanguine. Chemtrails are, are, are uh, serious clouds, and uh, they're water vapor emissions that come out of burning with jet fuel. And in certain circumstances, they, the, the contrails actually disappear pretty quickly because it's dry up there. At other times, when it's more moist, they tend to spread and they make a sort of serial, uh, serial, you know, sort of serial stratus haze. And uh, chemtrails are mythical creatures that refer to a conspiracy theory that the government's trying to poison us so that the military's already trying to cool the planet with secret projects. This, this goes on really big in California. But we, we had a geoengineering meeting at the AAAS San Diego, and uh, outside, the, outside the building were the chemtrails protesters. Inside our building, we had the panel on climate engineering. And the AAAS was really worried because they had the, the first time they've had a protest at their meeting. And I remember, uh, I remember saying, uh, I don't know who's batty or the people in the room or the people outside, but there was no belief or, or, or evidence. I, I work with archival materials, and I work with, uh, I don't have a military clearance, but I work with old military stories about the interventions and stuff. And I don't have any documentation of chemtrails at all. But I do have people who are very sincere. Uh, they feel that they feel ill when they see the cirrus haze or cirrus Stratus, uh, and they feel that the military must be doing something to, uh, to test it. But for me, it's not part of history. It doesn't prove it doesn't exist, but it's not part of history. They're serious clothes. So, last call, huh? Right, and we're going to meet much. here, too, again later. So. Thanks for coming.